the music and the attitudes of people kind of change around Christmas time. And, um, and that's great. I wish we could carry on that spirit all year round because uh, it, it would make things so much easier for so many people. I'm glad that those that are visiting with us today that you're here and hope you can trust that you receive a blessing from the service. And uh, we're getting close to Christmas, real close, 10 days away from Christmas. That I know as a kid, it, uh, I look forward to it and my children all look forward to it. Now my grand and now my great grandchildren. It seems we go broke at Christmas time just trying to buy gifts for all all the families. It just seems to keep on growing. We had them all over for Thanksgiving, and uh, there were 34 of them. And so that's a big family. 34 get together, and they'll be there again for Christmas. And I tried to fool them one year. One year I went to visit my brother down in New Orleans. He leaves a metairie. He has his business down there, car electric. And uh, so he wanted me to come down and spend uh, Christmas with him. So we went down and uh, uh, had a great Christmas and enjoyed some of the food and hospitality of the people in, in New Orleans. And then when we came back, uh, my whole family was mad. They were mad because they said, where were we supposed to go? You know, <laughs> so we, we can't leave town anymore on those holidays. You got to be there for Christmas and got to be there for Thanksgiving and, and Easter. All of those great holidays. Christmas is a time that we've been looking forward to and uh, for, uh, with all of our activities and parties and things geared toward looking forward to Christmas. But it's well, it's a time of looking forward. It, it's also a time of reminiscing of looking back in our lives and uh, at our past Christmases. And some do it with a certain air of melancholy that uh, remember, and it's not, and it's not going to be the same anymore as it was. But as we look back, I want you to think this morning, what was the greatest gift that you ever got? It's probably popped into your mind already. What was the greatest Christmas gift that you ever received? You know? We always have that one gift that stands out that we remember. I like the, the television series that come on uh, at, where that young boy wants a, a, days, uh, he wants a Red Ryder BB gun. And uh, I think about that. Uh, I did too. I didn't get a Red Rider. I got a Daisy pump. And you pumped it like this to, to get it to shoot instead of clicking it like the Red Rider did. But uh, those are things that you remember. I want to talk about uh, David and uh, uh, Debbie uh, uh, Schaefer. Uh, David and Debbie uh, live in Moline, Illinois. And uh, it was getting close to Christmas, and she's already starting to do some of her uh, Christmas shopping. So she had gone uh, to Walmart and places like that. And uh, she started back in about September. And uh, she went to a, a, the hunting store that they had there, and uh, she found what she felt was the ideal gift for her husband. And uh, so she brought it home, and uh, she said, I can't wait. I can't wait till December the 25th to give him this gift. I'm so excited about it. I know it's expensive, $127.50, and I usually don't spend that much, but uh, it, it's so important. It says, I think I'll give it to him now. This is back in September. And so when she got it home, she went ahead and gave him uh, the, the Christmas gift. Well, came October the 1st, the alarm went off, and he jumped in his patrol car and headed to where a robbery was taking place. Because David was a patrolman with the Moline Police Department. And as he got to the place where the robbery was occurring, uh, you, uh, about to enter the door, and out comes the fellow that, the, that was doing the robbing and took his gun and shot David. He wasn't five feet away from him. That slug hit him in the chest, knocked him back about three feet, and then... Uh, knocked him over. He got up and by then the robber had taken off and he was not able to catch the robber. Just reported it all. By then the other officers had arrived at the scene. And the only thing that happened to him after getting shot right there was he had a big bruise. Big bruise on his chest. 
because that Christmas gift that the wife couldn't wait to give to her husband was a bulletproof vest. A bulletproof vest. And I says that bulletproof vest saved his life. And I'm sure it did. And it has in many cases that you see on television now and uh, where so many uh, programs dealing with uh, the police department and law enforcement and so on. And uh, I, I, I'm guilty. I watch some of those programs. I enjoy not seeing people get caught, but I just enjoy seeing that there are there is justice in our system. I'm looking for justice. And, uh, but the thing is, he, all he got was a bruise out of it. Saved his life. God looking down from heaven 2,000 years ago. Thought, what can we give those people? I've tried to make myself known to them in so many ways. They know me here in the Old Testament uh, as the God above the earth. But how do I ever communicate my love to them and the messages and things I have of concern to them uh, if I'm up here and they're down there? And so he made a conscious decision in the council halls of heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He says, I need somebody to go down. I need somebody to go down so they can understand and know me. As God. What God chose to tell us of Himself in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, the 34th chapter, beginning in verse, uh, nine, uh, verse 5, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Him, talking about Moses now, and stood with and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sins. Well, that tells a lot about God. And information didn't come from Moses. It came from God to Moses. God says, let me tell you about myself, Moses. You want to know something about me? These are the characteristics of my nature. But we would see we were seeing God at a distance. Moses, as much as he wanted to see God, God says, no, I'm going to put you over here in the cleft of the rock. I'll pass by, but, uh, you know, you can see my hinder parts, but you can't see my face. But God is wanting to declare himself through his face. So here you look down from the call to and says, I need a perfect sacrifice to shed blood. Because the blood of bulls and goats is not effective anymore with me. It's not, it's not the, the, the sweet odor that I'm looking for to come up to the heavens. I need somebody to go down as the all-perfect sacrifice. And Jesus came down. It was God wrapped in the flesh. Wrapped in the flesh. He came down to tell us several things about himself and his kingdom. Sometimes we forget all of that because of everything else that's happening at Christmas time. But I want us to, this morning in, in our message to understand what God has given to us. He's given us a, uh, doesn't give us a bulletproof vest, but He's given us a vest of righteousness. Not our righteousness, His righteousness. He says, put this righteousness on you. And the way that you put it on is by baptism. In Galatians 3, 27, For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We have a lot of people who are exposed to Satan today and uh, as they go out into the world because they have never put on the breastplate of righteousness that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. That He is our Savior, our Redeemer. And we rejoice concerning that every year at Christmas time. For our scripture this morning, let's take and go to Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter. And it's the uh, traditional story, but we're just only going to read a part of it because it's so lengthy. I wish we had time uh, to read it all, but we're going to read verses 18 to 25 of the, uh, concerning the birth of Christ, Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together... 
she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, <coughs> excuse me, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Isn't that the most powerful verse? I like John 3, 16, but that's a powerful verse right there. Jesus is coming to do what? Save you from your sins. That's the gift he's bringing with him. He's bringing salvation. He says, save the people from their sins. Now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken uh, by, uh, by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife. And he did not know her till he had brought forth her firstborn son, and his name called his name Jesus. God gave us the gift that we desperately needed. I know as a young boy that uh, being raised in an orphanage, we didn't get toys. We got what we needed. A new pair of socks, maybe a new pair of shoes, sometimes blue jeans. What, when you really got a, an outstanding gift, it was Lee blue jeans. All the other times it was Wrangler. I don't know, all the blue jeans growing up all my life was Wrangler. And somebody sent me a pair of blue, uh, blue jeans that were, says Lee across the back. I was somebody, I had Lee blue jeans. You remember stuff. But we got what we needed, not what we wanted. And what we needed, it was really important. God, same thing. But God's gift to us is that he wants to be with us. That's his gift. I want to be with you. That's what Christmas is all about. God wanting to be with us. In fact, the first words that, that we have of Jesus are not after he's here on earth. Jesus speaks before he comes to earth. You've got to remember, Jesus didn't begin in Bethlehem. He's always existed with God in heaven. That was when his manifestation in the flesh took place was at Bethlehem. As in a microscopic, uh, uh, just a moment, placed into the womb of the Virgin Mary and grew up uh, to be the Son of God that you and I know and worship as Jesus Christ and as our Lord because He's going to save the people from their sins. But look, looking over to Hebrews, the uh, 10th chapter and verses uh, 5 through 7, this is Jesus speaking in heaven before he comes down in the form of a baby to be born in Bethlehem. It says in verse 5, Therefore when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice is an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. He says, I'm coming, God. I'm ready to go. You, burnt, offering of burnt sacrifices don't satisfy you. You need the perfect sacrifice. And I come down as the perfect sacrifice to die for people's sin who do not deserve it. We didn't deserve what he did for it. We got it as a gift. As a gift of his love. I know uh, we can know a little bit about God. Just observing nature itself. It tells us that in, in Romans the first chapter. That uh, people are without excuse. Because they can see nature itself. And understand that there is a, a creator behind that. But God says no I want to be known face to face. That's always important. Face to face. I stop and think. God stipulated that when he told the angel Gabriel, tell him that his name will be called Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God's with us. He was in the Old Testament, he was above. In the New Testament, he's below. He's here now in the form of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In our church, we worship the Almighty God. 
and, and the Lord Jesus Christ because he is with us. He didn't wind up this world as the deists believe and go off into space somewhere and someday he's coming back and, and going to take control. No, he's here now. You know, we, we spend our time in prayer and we get close to God. James says, draw nigh unto God and he will what? Draw nigh unto you. Sometimes I say that in my prayer. When I'm down on my knees, I say, God, I need you to come close today. I need help. I need understanding. I need guidance. God, I need you. I need you. And God does. Through the Holy Spirit, He just comes in and fills my heart and life. And, and I see things differently. I begin to see things through spiritual eyes. I begin to think holy thoughts through my mind. Because God is with us. And that's what he wanted to tell. His gift was a giving of himself in Jesus Christ. In John's gospel, the uh, uh, first chapter, verse 18 says, No man has seen God at any time. Only The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. He's told us what God is and what God is like. He's declared Him. Made a declaration. Again in John 12, verse 44 and 45, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. He says, when you see Jesus, you see God. That's what he told uh, Philip too. He says, Philip, have I been with you so long? If you've seen me, you've seen God. You know what God looks like. So I like to read the Gospels, especially uh, Matthew and uh, Luke, because they have the, the, the narrative concerning the birth of Jesus Christ and his entry into the world. And I read the other Gospels as well. John's a fantastic Gospel, very cosmic in its uh, uh, scope. And, uh, but I, I read that because I want to see what God's like. I want to know more about God. I want to know everything that I can know that He has revealed. We wouldn't know anything about God if He hadn't revealed it to us. All we could do is look at the universe and say He's a God of, of creation. He's a God of order. You know. But we wouldn't know much more about God than that. Until He says, I want my people to know me. And I want them to know me face to face. What does one of the Beatitudes say? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to have that pure heart because I want to see God. I want to see God. And we will see God in the future. Uh, he wants a personal recognition. In John 1.11 says, Though he came into his own, in his own, what? Received him not. And I got to thinking about that. And I thought, you know, God never really knew loneliness. No, he didn't know. He never really knew rejection. You know, I'm not talking experientially. He's never known those type of things. But then Jesus comes down. And in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, we read that he was in all points tempted as we are. And yet without sin... Jesus went through everything that you and I have gone through and without sin. And when I think about that, now he can say, I know, I know. You know when a person is uh, recounting their illness to you and, and what their problems and things are medically, and you say, you know, I'm with you, meaning I, I understand, I know where you're coming from with this, you know, I've experienced it. Jesus can say, whatever we experience, I know, I'm with you. I've been there, done that. I've experienced that. All points I've experienced just as you are, and yet without sin. He says, that's what I wanted. I wanted to come down and show you God so that you could know more about God. The story was told of a plainly dressed man that went into a church in the Netherlands one Sunday morning. And he sat, went down toward the front and he sat in his seat. And pretty soon a lady came in, stately dressed lady, and she looked at him and says, Sir, you're sitting in my seat. Would you please move? And so he got up and went to the back of the church, and there was where the poor section was in the church, and sat back there. After the service was over that morning, one of the men in the church went over to the lady and says, Ma'am, do you know who that man was that was sitting in your seat, the one that you told to get up and leave, move? He says, no. He says, that's King Oscar 
of Sweden. He's here to visit with our queen over some state business. I wonder sometimes if you and I haven't rejected holy things because we've not had the spiritual eyes in order to see them. Consider that first Christmas. Jesus came into his own. You think everybody's excited. Everybody should have been excited. He'd been preparing them all through history up through the Old Testament with all the prophecies and things of, of his coming. There's over 300 prophecies of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that he's fulfilled, the most of which are, uh, he's fulfilled are in the New Testament, some yet to be fulfilled in the book of Revelation later on. But for the most part, he was prophesied and he fulfilled that prophecy and he came into our world so that we could know him. You know. We were delivered by Jesus Christ. Three precious things that I want to share with you for this Christmas. Number one, he delivered the news that God is real. Now this is more important. Your Christmas gift, he delivered the news that God is real. He's not a figment of our imagination. He's not like Ludwig Feuerbach says, uh, you know, he's... Uh, said that in his philosophy that man projects an image and then man follow, worships that image and creates that image and the only God is the God that man has created within himself. That's Ludwig Furbach. Some bad, theo <laughs> bad theology that he's come up with. Man doesn't create God. God created man. man. And we need to understand that. That we were delivered... He, God delivered the news that he is real in Jesus Christ. I want to know that. I want to know the God I worship is real. He came down and he was seen. He lived. He died. And, and he ascended back into heaven. And he's coming back again. And he sent down the fire from heaven in the form of the uh, tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. He did all of that. And he's coming back. And he's coming back. And I'm excited about that. And we'll look forward to that day that he comes. Uh, remember the first uh, person to ever orbit the Earth? He was a Russian cosmonaut by, a cosmonaut, uh, by the name of Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin. And uh, he was being interviewed by the TASS news agency after he had made his uh, orbit of the Earth in his spacecraft. And they landed and took him. And uh, somebody asked him, uh, when you were out there in space, did you see God? And he says, no, I looked all through the spaces I went through. I never saw God. W.A. Criswell, who was a preacher of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, that big church. I like what he said. He said, tell him to step out of that spacecraft for five seconds and he'll see God. <laughs> yes, yeah, we don't see with the naked eye. I can't look up and see God, but I know God exists. I like what uh, that God has been spotted. I like what Eugene Peterson says in the message concerning that. It says, John 1, 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Eugene comes on and says, The first news of Christmas is that there is a God, and this God is not some abstract power. This God is is a real person. Boy, isn't it exciting that whenever you pray, you're, pray, you're not just praying, praying to, to a statue or to an idol or to anything else like that. You're praying to a real God, a real person, a real person that can understand and can is acquainted with all of our needs that is here, that God is real. Not only does God is God real and that God exists, uh, He's a self-revealing God. He reveals Himself to us. Over in the book of Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, uh, let me just read something to you here. Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, verse 23. This says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him glory who glories in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. 
Did you get that? We can know God. He says you can know. You can't know God. God says yes, you can. You read the Word here, in here and get in there and see the see God in operation. And let the Holy Spirit work in your life, and you can know God. You can know God. That's why he said the the tragedy is people don't know God. They know a little bit about God, but they don't want to know too much about God. But here it is. He says that, the, that you can glory in this that I am the Lord. He is God, exercising all of these things about Him. But what if? What if, if God decided not to let us know anything about Him? I, I could come up with some ideas. First place, there would be no answers that give life meaning. Stop and think about that. Uh, questions like, where did I come from? Or what's the purpose of life? Where, am I, where is life going? You know? We would not have answer to these and questions like that if we didn't know anything about God. Second place I listed down, uh, we would, there would be no standards of determining values. There would be no absolutes. Uh, there would be no constant rights and constant wrongs. For if there was no God, every man would do just as he pleases. Remember what they did in the Old Testament before God destroyed the world? He says, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. He, just, he became his own God, so to speak. And he just made his own determining of what's valuable and what's not valuable. Third place, there would be no inherent value in human life. Who's the God that says that the poor man matters just as much as the rich man? God. Isn't that great? That a little 12-year-old boy in an orphanage that needed salvation, that I'll let my son die for him. As I let him die for the richest man in, the, in America. And I got saved in the church and baptized into the Lord. Who's the God that says that a baby in the womb is just as valuable as a baby that's just already been born? Our God. Our God. Third, there would be no inherent value of human life. And fourth, we have, would have no sense of human justice. I see things that are happening all the time, and I think, God, there needs to be some justice. There will be someday. Someday the scales will be balanced, and God will balance them. The thing about God is, He doesn't balance His books every Friday. He doesn't balance them once a month. But the books of God one day, folks, are going to be balanced. And whosoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. That's it. My name's in a book. It's in the Lamb's book of life. And I'm one of His. My name's in there. And that great banquet table that we're going to sit at in heaven with Jesus Christ, the, the bridegroom, as the church of the bride is presented unto Him, there's a name tag uh, for my place at that table. It says Dale Carr. And I'm going to get there and sit my, at my place at the table. And it says that Jesus is going to serve those people at His table. Jesus is going to serve me. God Himself is going to serve I do count. I do matter. You do too. He's given worth to each and every one of us. And finally, we'd have no hope beyond the grave if there was no, no Jesus. No hope beyond the grave. That when it comes to death, death is death and nothing more. But to me, as a Christian, I have hope beyond the grave. We spend about, what, 40 weeks in our mother's womb waiting to be born into this time-space dimension that we're living in right now. But we live so many years here getting ready to be born into eternity. Because one of these days we're going to go through that door called death and we're going to go out into eternity. Going out into eternity to be with God. Unless Jesus Christ comes back before that. Jesus tells us that God is near. God is near. That's what Emmanuel means. That God is present with us. One of my favorite songs is Joy to the World. The Lord, what? Is come. Not has come. Not will come. He will come though uh, to get all his people. But the Lord's here. Joy to the world. 
Matthew 28, 20, last verse in Matthew says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commandeth you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto 